I'm Adam Ashenfelter from BigML. We, uh, we build a uh, machine learning as a web service with an emphasis on democratizing machine learning. We try to make, make the tools as accessible for non-experts as we possibly can. Um, I'm not really going to talk about our service today, but what I am going to talk about is what we've learned in the world of anomaly detection when we uh, built it into our, into our service. So, uh-oh. Oh, that took about 10 seconds before something went wrong. <laughs> uh, well, the slides are not switching. Oh, thank you, thank you. Okay, so uh, why do we care about anomaly detection? Uh, it's a facet of unsupervised learning that uh, kind of has this idea that we think uh, we have some regular data and then some anomalous data that, that may be generated from a different process than the rest of our data. And we'd like to go and, and try to identify those, those strange points. And it's used in all sorts of different ways, like data cleaning in case you know, you've got erroneous values in your data. Uh, it can be used in, in like sensor networks if you're getting tons and tons of data coming in. Uh, and some scientists want to go and kind of find the interesting points instead of reading through everything. Uh, it can help there. Uh, there's kind of security and fraud detection, and that's the, the classic use of anomaly detection. That seems to be very, you know, a popular realm for it. Um, and then it can do, you know, nice things like if you've built a uh, uh, predictive models on some data sets and you turned it into a uh, API that you're using. Well, it might be a good idea to also build anomaly detection on that same training data, run it at the same time, and watch whether your scores, you know, do a moving average or something of your scores over time. And if they're creeping up, that tells you that something about the world changed and, and you better, you know, not trust the answers you're getting and you might need to retrain your, your predictive models. So, uh, a few years ago, uh, DARPA, uh, Started, or started a research project, the Adams Project, where the, uh, had a large corporation, and it stays anonymous, that uh, had five, about 5,000 of their employees monitored with what a uh, soft, piece of software called SureView. Um, and SureView is, you know, it was very much a big brother application. It would watch all the, all the uh, uh, files that you accessed over the network, who you emailed, just pretty much everything you did on, did on your computer, and it would uh, turn that into sort of telemetry for each, each employee. Um, and so what then they had some security experts go and decide that they wanted to overlay on top of real data, real people's telemetry, uh, what, the, what they would expect to see if they had an attacker. Like, someone who was trying to encrypt data so that SureView couldn't see it for some nefarious reason, or if someone was trying, you know, was laid off and was going to try to, to uh, cause havoc um, and, you know, mess up the network as much as they could, or if someone was, let's say, going to leave the company and was trying to steal data um, that might, might be worth money before they did so. Um, and so, anyway, these security experts kind of hand built the, these attackers and they overlaid them on top of real employees. And uh, after that, DARPA hel held a monthly competition where different research universities would compete to find these attackers amongst those data streams. Uh, and so our chief, chief scientist, Tom Diekert, who is also a faculty member at Oregon State University, uh, his research group was competing in these monthly contests. Uh, and you wanted to try out, I mean, you had to do the standard feature engineering to try to, try to uh, find the interesting things to look for, but, but they wanted to apply uh, some different anomaly detectors to that and, and see what worked. Uh, but they were a little bit disappointed when they, when they dug into the literature in that um, it's, it's hard to really have a good comparison against different anomaly detectors. In general, most anom uh, most uh, data sets uh, people use are, tend to be confidential, and so public ones are few and far between. Uh, and again, they're confidential largely because anomaly detection is so often used in sort of security scenarios, and no one wants to make it public how someone hacked into your system, you know. Um, anyway, so they, they tried a number of different uh, uh, techniques. 
Uh, and they even had some success with one of, uh, some of them, uh, specifically isolation forests and ensembles of Gaussian mixture models. Uh, but still, they were frustrated by the lack of good public data sets. And then even then, when they had success with it, well, you can't really publish about that because the data sets from DARPA, there's no way that you know, those can become public. Uh, and what good is a scientific research paper where you say, well, we did really good on some data that no one else can ever look at or reproduce. So that, that kind of ruins the point. Um, so that led to some work of, you know, let, let's, let's try to take some of the really nice public data sets that, uh, super, for supervised learning that UCI uh, maintains, and let's transform them into something we can use for anomaly detection. Uh, and before I get deeper into that, though, I wanted to do a super quick review of some of these uh, anomaly detection algorithms that I had up there just a second ago. Um, and so one of the kind of oldest and well used is the one class SVM and that builds a uh, Uses a support vector machine, but it just projects the data away from the origin and looks for a hyperplane uh, to, to try to uh, Get that data as far away from the origin as possible um, And it's you know, it's been used for quite a while now and it's available in libSVM and R and scikit-learn So it's it's pretty easy to get a hold of uh, and there's a somewhat more recent flavor of it where they just use a hypersphere. Um, and that actually does better in practice. And it's available on libSVM tools. And most of you probably know about support vector machines. But just in case you don't, and you don't know what I'm talking about when I say, you know, hyperplane, um, this is the stupid 30,000 foot explanation of a support vector machine. So let's imagine this is our, uh, our one dimensional data set. And we want to separate the red points from the green, green points. Um, and what we'd really like to do is draw a line or a plane uh, that, that will do that. And, but in one dimension, that's completely impossible. Um, but if we project this data up into a higher dimension, then maybe we can do it. But we need some sort of function to help decide what our y values will be in this higher dimension. So in this case, that, or this was our, uh, the function we're going to use, or in SVM lingo, the, a kernel. Uh, and we're just going to project our points up. And what do you know? Now we can actually go find uh, a line that will separate those things. So the one class SVM doesn't really care about different classes. It's really just trying to find a nice separation of those points from, from the origin. Um, another, uh, the other like commonly used anomaly detector is a local outlier factor, and this has been around for quite a while too. It's, it's part of R. Uh, and it tries to use, a, 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 well, first I'll say, if I ask you, you know, what is the most anomalous point in this tiny little two-dimensional data set, hopefully you would say this one right over here. Um, and the, the local outlier factor is doing is figures, OK, we could look at distance between points to help us decide what an outlier is. But that's not enough. Like, these guys are about as far away as those guys. But this is just a more spread out cluster. And so it's kind of normal for points over there to, to have those distances. But the, that's a tight cluster here. And so all of a sudden, that's, that's a little bit more unusual. Um, and so what this, uh, what this will do is uh, you define some number k. And for every point, we will look at their k neighbors and find the average distance. Uh, and we'll, we'll turn that into sort of a density score. So that'll give us an idea of how dense is the local space around each point. Uh, now, for each point to actually come up with an anomaly score, we'll say, OK, uh, now I want to compare this, you know, the, the point in question's density score compared to its neighbor's average density scores. So now these guys' densities will actually be pretty high, while this guy's density is pretty low. And we'll go, yeah, that's, that's kind of fishy. Uh, but this guy's density is low, but his neighbor's densities are also low. And that's fine. It's not too strange. Um, and that works pretty well. But the trick is you have to pick how many neighbors. You have to pick this k. Um, and there's also the ensemble of Gaussian mixture models. This was uh, uh, actually created by Tom Dietrich and Andrew Emmett um, in part of their work with DARPA. Uh, and, and this paper they did for benchmarking that I'll get to in just a minute. Uh, but the idea here is, OK, let's fit a Gaussian mixture model to 
to uh, our data. And again, we have a magic K we need to pick. Um, so in this case, we picked three. We fit the Gaussians using EM. Uh, and you can sort of see you know, the decision boundaries that fall out. And it can work OK uh, if you pick the right K. But again, who, who likes that? That's, that's no good. So instead, we'll just make an ensemble out of it. Um, you know, and we'll pick just a variety of K, fit each one with the EM, do a whole bunch of them. Uh, we'll throw out the ones that didn't fit the data very well. We'll keep, keep some of the better ones. And then we'll use that entire ensemble to give us an idea of how regular a point looks. Um, and so there's also the isolation force. This is a, a, a well, newer than some of the others that we looked at, but not that new anymore. It's uh, available on R and um, coming up in a development branch of, development branch of scikit-learn. Uh, and it's also one of the a method we've built into BigML with some extensions that I'll talk about later. Uh, and the basic idea here is we're just going to take a little, uh, a little sample from the data set, 256 points. Uh, then we're going to choose a random field and just make a random, with that field, we look at the minimum value, the maximum value, and we just make some random split in between that space. So we uh, uh, then just grow the tree, repeat that over and over again until every point is isolated in, into a leaf node. Uh, and why do we do that? Well, we're going to, here's the classic iris data set. We're just looking at sepal length and sepal width, I think. Um, but we're pretending it's a two-dimensional data set for this tiny demo. And we're going to make some random split on the, on the y-axis here. And we're just going to kind of travel down one branch of the tree. Now we do another random split, this time on the x-axis. And we continue. Here, let's make another random split. Oh, and what do you know? We, we've isolated that guy up there. That's nice. But we'll continue on. Made another split, isolated one more, and finally split again. And on this branch of the tree, we've isolated all the points. Now, the, the main kind of uh, intuition to, to note here is a point in low density space will tend to get isolated with fewer random splits than points in higher density spaces. Higher density spaces are just probably going to be deeper down in this tree that you grow. Uh, and but since, since that's true, we can suddenly use a, uh, one of these isolation trees as a kind of crappy uh, anomaly detector. Um, and so if we want to generate a score, let's say we have two dimensions, age and salary here, and we just evaluate the tree, go down, find the terminal node, and we output the depth of the node, in this case two. And so now we just grow a whole lot of trees to do this, and we find the av average depths of this entire ensemble, and the, uh, the deeper uh, the node happen, or the, the deeper or larger the, the depths are, the more regular the node is. The higher it is, meaning the, the shallower it fell out, then the more anomalous. Um, and then it's nice we can actually kind of normalize those, those depths by using the expected depth for a balanced binary tree. Um, and then we can kind of get a zero, run, zero one range where 0.5 means just regular and boring. Um, anything approaching one means, you know, anomalous. Anything below 0.5 means super normal, so really boring. Uh, so, and, and uh, these ensemble techniques, like the Gaussian mixture model and, and uh, the isolation forest, you know, work really well, and there, just this year, has been an interesting uh, new approach at yet another ensemble technique, this one called the Lightweight Online Detector of Anomalies, LODA. Um, and it was actually invented by Tomas Pevny, I hope I said that right, who is uh, here in Prague at, at CTU, and I had the pleasure of meeting just a little earlier today. Um, and this uses a shockingly simple approach, but actually works pretty well, which is let's just take a sparse random projection of our data, you know, just any old thing. It doesn't really matter. Um, we'll do that, and then we'll project all the points down onto that, uh, onto that and build a one-dimensional histogram. Uh, now that we've done that, if we want to score a point, uh, all we do is we use that same projection, we look up where it fell in that histogram, and using that bins count, we can now kind of get a, a crappy estimate of, of the probability of that point. And again, like a single 
single random projection histogram is not great, but if you build an ensemble of them, suddenly it, it is actually pretty powerful. Uh, and just like the name implies, uh, one of the really nice features of this is it can be just an, uh, a true online algorithm. Five left? Whew. Okay. <laughs> so uh, that means it can, you, know, you can update it per point. Uh, but anyway, it's fast and ridiculously easy to uh, uh, train and score, so it's a, it's a pretty nice option. And its performance in batch mode is actually competitive with isolation forests, which are pretty good. So going back to this idea of benchmarking, um, benchmarking our de uh, uh, anomaly detection, the idea is we want to make a bucket, take some supervised learning problem, make a bucket of anomalies, make a bucket of uh, regular points, but then we want to sample intelligently um, to, to make kind of hard problems for the anomaly detectors. And so we can, we can change certain dimensions, like how frequent different points are, the, the anomalies are, how clustered they are, small or scattered, and how difficult they are to separate. And, um, and so now we can take these original 19 data sets and we can blow it up to like, in this case, uh, over 4,000 benchmark data sets. Uh, and there is a nice way, if you have a multi-class data set, um, it's instead of just like randomly picking uh, certain classes to be our anomalies and randomly picking certain classes to be our uh, uh, regular points, what we can do is uh, fit some classifier like a random decision forest on all those points, make a graph where each node is the uh, uh, class and the edges are the number of misclassifications in between the two. So we know that, you know, some of the, in this case, we're looking at a uh, data set of, of uh, predicting uh, digit, or like handwritten digit, digit recognition. But anyway, so zero get mis misclassified as nine sometimes and nine gets misclassified as zeros. We can build a minimum spanning tree on that, do a two coloring of that, um, and now, now we, we can you know, mark our anomalies, but they're spread out. So, so that helps give us diversity in the processes uh, backing these anomalies, which makes it harder on our, on our ben benchmarks, which is good. We want to stress out our anomaly detectors. So like I mentioned, we've got, we can sample different frequencies for our anomalies. We can, whoops, change the difficulty by um, sampling so that points are more or less separable. Uh, and we can also sample so that the, the anomalies are clustered tightly, kind of spread out, or really scattered. Um, and if we go and run our anomaly detectors against those benchmarks, whoa, we can sort of see what we'd expect, that it's harder if anomalies are more frequent, it's harder if they're really clustered, and it's harder if uh, they're, they're not very separable. And that's kind of what we want. Now we see that we are stressing our anomaly detectors so we can make a good comparison. Um, and so this is over those you know, 4,000 plus tests, which detectors actually do well. Uh, we're looking at area under the curve here, isolation forest as well, same with LOF, kind of drops off and the one class SVM struggles. So what are the nice things about, uh, okay. Isolation forests, uh, that you know, we saw the nice performance that led us to want to integrate them into big ML, but they also have some other nice features. Um, again, they're simple to build because they're random, but uh, uh, they also can gracefully handle missing values at scoring time. And what do I mean by that? We'll go back to this super tiny isolation tree. And if we don't know age, we can just act as though both branches of this tree are true and evaluate um, and find multiple uh, terminal nodes now, and we just average their tree depth. Um, and if we do that, that's, it kind of gives us nice abilities now that we can choose what we care about when we want to score an anomaly and what we don't want to care about. Uh, and that makes, lets us do things like make partial dependency plots. So if we had uh, some data, artificial data set where points are arranged like a cylinder, we can marginalize out the depth and say, hey, I just want to look at a plot of how my anomaly scores uh, change based on, you know, just two axes and we can, you know, see something like this. So it's nice for exploratory work. Uh, uh, the other thing is you can actually do uh, explanations of anomalies. Um, and 
we can do that by kind of stealing the trick used in the, uh, with random decision forests, uh, originally called Gini variable importance, where every time there's a split in a tree, you kind of measure the improvement you're making and you credit the field that uh, was used for doing that split. For isolation trees, that improvement is really how many points are being separated away uh, whenever that split happens. And uh, once you do that over an entire ensemble, you can get these nice sort of relative distributions. Uh, which lets us know, you know what, what fields led to this being anomalous. Um, the other nice thing is they're parameter free. Uh, the bad thing is that's kind of a lie and they're not really parameter free. Um, what I mean there is in the original paper, the authors are like, hey, take 256 samples, take uh, 100 trees and it works pretty well. And in fact, in all these benchmarks, that's what, that's what uh, was done. It was never optimized. Uh, the other anomaly detectors use cross-validation to optimize the parameters. Isolation 4 still look good, so they are you know, robust. They don't really need to be optimized much with those parameters. But it's still, if you have things like really wide data sets, you're going to need more trees. How many? It's tough to say. Um, and the final thing is that uh, if you want to use these with more real-world da uh, data sets, you do need extensions to handle like discrete values and categorical data. Uh, it's not too hard to do that, but uh, if you do, it can actually still do all right. Like on the UCI mushroom data set, we had a uh, 96, or yeah, 0.966 AUC, which, which was pretty good. Um, anyway, that is the whirlwind tour of our work with anomaly detection. If you'd like to see it uh, in, in practice in our system, then I invite you to come to the BigML workshop tomorrow. Uh, and that's, that's it. Did I eat up all of our time for questions, or do we still? Yes, we have time for uh, some questions. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, in the slide with AUC scores uh, averaged over data sets, some of the classifiers had mean value less than 0.5. Does it mean that they were just working worse than random on average, or is that an yeah, precision so, recall AUC? So in this case, it's really uh, what the AUC means is if you took a point at random from the from the anomalies and you put took, took a point from random from the regular points and you scored them both, what's the probability that the anomaly scored higher? Um, and if it's, yeah, if it's scoring less than five, it's not doing terribly well, but. The benchmarks, you know, we did intent, they were intentionally made to be difficult, some of them, right? Like where, where they were really uh, not very well separated and clustered together. So, so sometimes it's just nearly impossible to do well, but that's, that's the nice thing about benchmarks is to really stress, stress the detectors. So for the isolation forests and other methods, how much, uh, how much do they depend on the coordinate system? If you, for example, rotate the coordinates or somehow transform uh, the, the yeah. variables? So uh, yeah, that, that for ones that are doing like nearest neighbor calculations um, for like the locality uh, uh, outlier factor, that makes a difference. You want to do things like scale everything to have the same standard deviation. Uh, that one of the nice things about the isolation forests is since you're just doing you know, independent axis parallel splits, it doesn't matter. You don't need to do that. So it can be whatever scale. You're just taking a min, you're taking a max, and doing some random split. Oh. Would you, for example, do a linear transformation on your data while measuring or something like that? Well, that's a good point. Yeah, since you are doing axis parallel splits, the uh, uh, rotation, rotating the data would make a difference in what looks anomalous to some extent, right? Um, and there is a, a different flavor of isolation forests, I think called psi forests, that do projections rather than axis parallel splits to try to, you know, avoid that. But in practice, they don't actually work better on a lot of these data sets. But, but if rotation is important, you'd probably want to do that. Do you have some time for questions? Uh, you talked about detecting outliers uh, here oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. uh, in sets of objects, but what about uh, detecting outliers in uh, data streams, like um, 
when um, you want to detect some say security issue you i think uh, you often need to find a series of actions which is dangerous not uh, not j uh, just uh, sing individual of these actions but a mm. series as a wall Okay, so some sequence rather than just yeah. an independent point. How can this be done? Yeah, well, these, these are all kind of assuming IID points. Um, so, I mean, you could do the trick of taking some window of time and doing aggregations over that or, you know, turning that into you know, deriving features from a window to t try to catch that. But you're right. Natively, these, these uh, aren't built for sequences. Hello. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, I was impressed that you find out a Czech student from a Czech university. So can you tell us how, how did you find him? Um, so I think twofold. Um, I heard about the Loda work uh, a few months ago from, from Tom Dietrich, who, who was impressed with it and how well it worked. Um, and he actually did the hard work of when he uh, published it. He went and uh, did, this, did the uh, benchmarking to, to really because um, so, so many anomaly detection publications don't, don't do that, right? Uh, and I actually didn't realize he was, you know, here in town until actually two days ago when I was working on the slides. So it was a, it was a nice happy bonus to, to get to meet him. Okay, no other questions? Then thank right. you again. Yeah, thank you much.